and attendance. It's the first ever public, open to the public training webinar we've hosted from North America, and the response has been overwhelming, which is a first for us. Our next open to the public webinar is going to be website or follow us on LinkedIn for the latest news and updates and information on upcoming webinars for all regions and languages. Some housekeeping points first before we start today. All attendees will be automatically placed on mute during the session. However, we encourage lots of questions. Lots of questions make for a lively and fun webinar. Due to the large number of people on the webinar today, we'll only be taking these questions via logged questions in the section on the GoToMeeting side panel, which will be answered by one of our four technical applications engineers that we have on the call today. So type away with those questions. A reminder to you all that this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you via an email upon the conclusion of this webinar after approximately 24 hours. Our presenter today is Levy Guzman, who is our Global Applications Leader at Mollicop and is based in Lima, Peru. He's worked for Mollicop for over 28 years and travelled the world presenting and speaking at major mining shows and seminars. In addition to hosting numerous face-to-face -face and webinar-based training courses for our Mollicop training division. In addition to being one of the most foremost world experts in mining communication, he is a huge supporter and advocate of passing on his knowledge and expertise to the next generation, and we're glad to have him today. Along with Levy on the call today, we have our applications engineering team from North America. They are Raynath Law, applications engineer for Canada and Alaska, who's based in Kamloops in eastern Canada. We have Mike Larson, Applications Engineer for the USA, who's based in the Minnesota, USA. Luis Lozano, Applications Engineer for Mexico, based in El Salto, Mexico. And finally, we've got Jeevan George, our Global Technical Sales Engineer for our cast side chrome product range and fine grinding, who's also based in the USA. So we've got a wealth of experience on the panel today, so I'd encourage you all to keep them busy and sub submit as many questions as possible. They'll respond to you directly via the question or chat function on the GoToMeeting side panel. Please allow time for them today to respond as we have a lot of people on the call today. Mollicop's technical support philosophy is based around our understanding of the customer's needs and objectives and is delivered through our core skill sets in geology, communication and flotation, delivered by our team of technical applications engineers based in the regions they support. They are supported by Mollicop's network of testing labs located in our major mining regions. Today's webinar is focused on the middle section of the table that relates to the common issues experienced in SAG milling operations. We are focused on the key operational variables that impact the stability of SAG mills and that negatively impact productivity and operating costs of these critical mining assets. Today's agenda. We'll begin with a brief outline of Mollicop's products and services and a quick summary of who we are and what we do. Then we'll hand over to Levy, who will outline the common variables that impacts um, stable SAG milling operations. Then we'll conclude with Levy responding to some of the questions that have been logged during that session. At the end of the session, we'll provide you with the topics and dates to the next Mollicop Open to the Public Training webinar for North America. To provide you with an overview of Mollicop and what we do, I'll hand over to Sandra Moore, who is the General Manager of Mollicop's operations in the USA and Canada. Thanks, Darren. On behalf of Mollicop's North American operations, I'd like to welcome you all today. You may know Mollicop as one, as well, of one of the world's leading suppliers of grinding media, but that's not all we do. We supply a range of standard and customised flotation reagents, we manufacture and distribute mill liner bolts and specialised fasteners for grinding mills and other applications such as transport and lifting equipment. We manufacture railway consumables, including forged rail wheels and axles for heavy haul mining, as well as passenger locomotives. And under the training banner, we've hosted hundreds of public and private courses around the world and trained over 7,000 people with courses both in person and now virtual. To support our customers, our global applications team provide technical support to all of our customers for mining operations around the globe. Mollicop's proximity to customers is the major, in the major copper and gold mining regions and our large global capacity is what differentiates us from our competitors. 
Our business model is based on local manufacture close to our customers. With manufacturing facilities and sales support in nearly all the major mining regions of the world, coupled with our world-class logistics network, you can be sure no mine will ever stop over Molokov. A little bit about North America. With the start-up of the new NG SAG line in Mexico, NG SAG balls are now manufactured locally in each of our three facilities in North America. All North American customers have free access to Molokov's lab facility based in Mexico for standard tests such as the bond work index and bond abrasion index. You can also see highlighted on the image of our Mexican facility, our recently commissioned drop ball tester. The drop ball tester is used to simulate the impact environment of large stag mills. These test units are installed at all Mollycott manufacturing sites in the Americas. All North American customers have access to one-on-one -on -one consultations with applications engineers or possessing practical plan experience. I'll now hand you back over to Darren. I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Sandy. As I mentioned earlier, the next Open to the Public webinar for North America will be held on the 17th of March, 2021. Today, you will have the opportunity to pick the topic for that webinar via a poll. And that concludes my portion of the presentation today. I'm going to hand you over to Levy. But before I do, a quick reminder, I'd encourage you all to submit as many questions as possible. Our technical applications team is on hand to answer all your questions. We'll distribute a list of these questions and their responses from our team via email after the webinar. Thank you all for your time and your attendance today. I'm now going to pass you on to Levy Guzman to begin today's webinar. Enjoy. Morning, everybody. <clears throat> I want to see if uh, you can see my screen. Okay. So, uh, as, as Darren presented at the beginning, we are going to, to review some ideas how to optimize and, and how to operate the, in the right way the meters. First of all, we are going to, to look for some advantage of the of the SAC meeting, for example. Some advantage of the SAC meeting, for example, uh, the feed to the mill is, is going to be large um, until rocks of 10 or 12 inches. So, uh, so avoiding the, trace, the traditional crushing, the classification, and the multiple storage uh, stage of intermediate sized particles. Also, we can use these rocks as a zero cost grinding media. This is the meaning of autogenous grinding, that this was uh, combining with balls to give the same autogenous grinding. We can add large and uh, diameter steel balls at up to 6.5 inches. They uh, want to show my screen. Uh, also, in the thermogenous grinding, you can get a uh, high throughput from 2,000 until to 4,500,000 uh, uh, tons per hour in the larger mills. But also in the in the sack mill, you have a disadvantage. What are the disadvantages of the of the thermogenous grinding? Usually, it's often one single line. So if the, if, the, if the concentrator which is going to shut down, the mill shut down, all the concentrator will shut down. The sack mill is very sensitive to the variation in the ore fit, especially to the size distribution fit and the hardness and the competence of the ore. It's difficult to, difficult to control and to get a consistent product. Sometimes you are going to get a coarser product, and other, and other times there's going to be a finer product. It depends on the competence of the ore. Uh, the same lesser thing, and for giving the incursion plant, incursion ball milling plants, or, and also it's not suited for all ore types. It's better for some some ore types, and, and other and other times it's not suitable for using static high media. Also, you can see in these pictures there is uh, uh, two kinds of the stack mills. One of them is the high aspect, high aspect uh, line, the uh, sack mill, where you have a higher diameter and, and short length. In another side, you have a high length uh, mill and, and shorter length. 
it depends on the milling action and, and, and the applications. When you are doing some, uh, some analysis of the sack mill, it's very important to know what are the, the dimensions, the real dimensions of the mill, especially the internal diameter. You have to see the internal diameter is between the liners. Also, you have to look for the, the internal length, also is between the, the liners. And it is, it's important to know how is the cone angle and also the trunnion diameter. Those are very important because if you are going to one uh, to perform a simulation, you have to know um, a very, very, very well how are the internal di dimension of the sack mill. Also, you, you have to look uh, what are the stack mill components. The stack mill components, uh, for example, you have to, you have the, that is a delay. Sorry, there is a delay in the, in the internet. You can, you have to to know the fitronium, the mill shell, the grates, the pull lifter. The pull lifter is very very important in the sack mill analysis, and also the discharge, discharge trunnion. You have uh, two components. One of them is the where where you perform the grinding this is into the mill shell, and the second one is the discharge. This is uh, especially related to the grate and the pull lifter. Also, it's important to know that the energy, as all, as all the combination processes, is the, the key for doing the grinding process. You can see that the, in, in semitogenous grinding, usually you take uh, between 10 to 25 kilowatts per ton to, to obtain a, a liberated size, the minus 100 microns. So this is my, how much is that? Is this is high or is low? It depends. It depends on the ore. You have to know uh, very. Uh, you have to know. You have to determine which the uh, specific energy consumption for your uh, for your ore. You can see in the graph, for example, you have a high high throughputs, around four thousand tons per hour. The specific energy consumption is uh, around three kilowatts per ton. But you are going to, to have a, a lower throughput around 2000. The specific energy consumption uh, could be the 8 kilowatts per ton. So, depending on the ore, uh, you are going to, to get a different kind of uh, specific energy consumption. And, and th that is one of the important uh, uh, key factors that you have to uh, determine in your operation. Also, it's important to know how this energy is going to be distributed into the stack mill. You can see here in this picture, you have a different regions. This is a, there is an, a cascading fly, the cascading path, the tow impact, the tow active, and the bull share. So, for example, in the cascade in fly, the balls and the rocks and in fly, there is zero work. There is not energy, there is no contact, there is no grinding. You have an, a minimal work, minimal energy contribution to the cascading zone. You have a high work zone. This is a, a compression zone between the, the, the shell or the, uh, the shell and the, and the chart of the sack. Also, you have an, uh, in the tow impact, the tow, you have a uh, maximum impact work, but in the low rate. So, this is a high impact, but it's low energy in this zone. And also this is the maximum work zone where you have a compression, a high pressure and high rate. So if you see this picture, usually uh, all the people say that the stack mills are uh, impact mills. But if you see this, this graph or this uh, DN simulation, you can notice that the most of the work is by abrasion and by compression. And, the, and you have a component which is an uh, impact, but this no, the main component 
in the stack menu. So, as, as we know, the breakers, the main make breakers mechanisms are the impact, the, the attrition, the abrasion, and he is missing the, the compression, which is also an important component for a for a for a breakage. So in, in semi-autogenous grinding, you are going to have a million of impact for the larger boards and larger rocks on, on the ore particles. You are going to need this, the energy to break the particles, but you can have an uh, excess energy and this energy is going to be wasted. For example, when, you, uh, when a large ball is going to hit a small rock, you are going to have an excess of energy. In another case, you are going to have a low energy and not, it's not efficient. For example, when in a small ball is going, is going to hit an, a, 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 a big rock. So the energy is not going to be enough for breaking the rock. Also, you are going to have a particle in loose beds. That means it's the trapped, the, the particles trapped between the balls. There is a presentation of impact to the ore particles. Yeah, there is also effectiveness of the energy transmission. So, uh, and also is the majority of the grinding work is, is in the rising shear regions. In this region, there is going to be many interactions this is a high pressure, and they are and, and this zone they so they are uh, they are tapping the particles. So in the compression zone between the charge and the and the liners, also there is the, the there is a high running work. How is the the energy related to the stack mill productivity? <clears throat> so there is a event of low peak energy, where the low breakage of the large rocks. Down, down to about 30 millimeters. So the, the rocks are, are going to be break in, in a low in a low rate. So the, the rocks also wear out through the abrasion. The rocks are going to fill up the mill. So you are going to have a, a overfilling when you have a low peak energies. And this the, this is a limit for the fit rate to the to the sack mill. What about the balls? The balls are going to increase the top impact energy, they are going to increase the breakage rate rate of the mid-side rocks between the 10 to 14 millimeters. And usually when you are using balls, um, you are getting to a coarser product. As higher the, the balls in size, you are going to get a coarser product. And what about the large rocks? The large rocks are going to slow abrasion and get Finer product, and but also these uh, large rocks are going to reduce the throughput of the mill. This is like in a brief introduction of the concept of energy and how the grinding is is, is driving in the mills. And we are now we are going to see this some operating variables and how it affects on the stack mill. What are the main the main operating variables in the in the in the stack mill. The first one, as all, all we know, is the ore type. The second one must be the could be the the stockpile. In the stockpile you are going to have a, a segregation and it is going to affect the the, the throughput of the stack mill. Another uh, variable is going to be the, the mill speed. Uh, how is the, the right mill speed? Usually all the plants try to run at the maximum mill as possible. Is it right or not? Running the mill at the high mill speed. The pebbles percentage, the, per, the production of the pebbles is another variable. The great opening, what is the right great opening in the sack mills? Usually, a uh, sack mill be, begins with a 2.5 inches uh, at the beginning, then open the, the rate to 3 inches, then to 3.5 inches, and they come back again to 2.5. How, how is it going on? They are, they are doing a, like an, a, a trial uh, to try to see how is the grades performing. The solid percentage, some operators like to work in a, a lower solid percentage 
they have the idea they are they are taking out faster the the slurry from the from the mill, and all the operators uh, like to work on a higher solid percentage. How is the right number? How is the liner design? The liner design usually is dry is the um, it's a matter of the maintenance people, but also the liner design has a, a highly high a higher effect in the grinding efficiency. How is the trommel opening? And how is the right size of the trommel opening? How how is the right ball filling into the mill? At beginning many years ago, the sack mill begins to operate at eight to twelve uh, uh, percent of ball filling, and now some operation gets until twenty percent of the ball filling. What is the right number? Another one is the total charge. How is the total the right total charge? The higher, the lower, how is the balance between the total charge and the ball fill? Another variable is the, the now is it's not a variable, it's in a it's like in a complementary uh, and it's persistent for trying to, to handle all these kind of variables. And for me, the more important variable is the operator. The operator is going to be a, a, a variable, a very important variable, because there is no two operators that is running the mill in the same way. If you make an benchmarking all over the world, you are going to see that the operators try to operate in the best manner they think. So the, the idea is to try to to give the operators the tools to understand how is the the variable how the variables affect op the mill operation to to try to to help them. So we are we not we are not going to review all the the variables. We are going to, to review the most important. One of them is the grade charge. The grade charge is important because has an, uh, a very, uh, has a complex function. Um, because uh, the, the grade is going to to maintain the charge into the into the mill until they get the the size of the open. Uh, the the only way that the particles are going out for the mill is when they when these particles get the the opening of the of the grade. So the the mill throughput is controlled no how fast you can stuff rock into it. So. Usually, the operators try to put more throughput and try to push the throughput into the into stack mill. This is not not so the most important. The most important is how fast you can pump pump out pump out the product out. So how fast you can get get out the product out of the mill. If you don't get the right size of the rocks according to the grade, you are not going to take out the the, the material out of the of the mill. So. The, the, the Greek has an, uh, a very important um, impact in the throughput. And uh, for this, you have to have a, a, a good grade design. You have to have a, a good pull lifter the dimensions and shape. And you have to have a, a, the, the right slurry viscosity. How is the, the sack flow mechanism? This is in a picture of the of the the sack. You can see in the bottom the, the transport group uh, is is going uh, in in the in the part of the, only in the bottom of the grade. It's not in the all the grade. It's only in, in one portion of the grade. If you have if you have an, uh, a a very open grade, you are going to have some effects. The flowback. This is one of the issues of the mill has, and the only the only the only the other problem the sacking has is the the carryover. It's not all the material is going out of the of the sack. Some material is is, is in a, as like in a circulating low to the flow back, and other material is in a carryover, and only a portion of the flow is going out of the mill. So. That is the so that is why it's so important. You have a very good design, a polyester. 
And how do you know you, you have an, an a flow back, you have a carryover? You have to perform usually crash stops to, to understand you have an, a, the flow back running. When you have a, a flow a flow back running, you are going to have an, a, the phenomenon is, is called the, the slow repooling. So you're going to notice like an, a pool at the end of the fragment, and you're going to notice a lot of water. You have a lot of water in this part of the of the segment. There, there is a slurry pulling problem. And what is the, the problem of the slurry pulling? That it, is that the balls are going to the balls and the rock is going to splash in the water, and there is not going to be grind, and there is good. Uh, it's not going to be the impact. The, this, this small part of the impact is going to be loose. And what, are, what about the hypothesis about the slow repooling and the breakage? So, as I mentioned, the slow repooling tends to reduce the amount of the higher impact events involved, involving the medium, medium, and media rocks. And that's the, all the rocks and the ball are, are going to just splash into the pool. So, in, the, in some cases, it, it's our, our right or our good when the impacts are not wanted, when the people don't want that the balls wear away very quickly, and when the size reduction is best done by balls sliding over another, but not an impact. It's only by ca uh, was cascading by the abrasion. And what is uh, happening if we need higher impacts in the sack mill? Uh, that uh, helps the wear down the rock media. Because if the rock media were down too slowly, they no exit to the mill and hence limit the throughput. So you are you are trying you are building the critical uh, size build up. So you are building the mill with the critical size and you are going to limit the throughput. So it's important to take out the pebbles out of the mill. So you will have you will have to design the grades according to the pebble discharge. We have to identify which size is the critical size and we we are we have to try to take out this critical size out of the mill to try to avoid the mill is going to be overfilled. This is about the grades and the and the pebbles. What about the, the mill power demand? The mill power demand is another important variable because as, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, the stack milling is in a energy related. And so for doing the comminution, uh, we need a power. And in Molico, we use the Hock and Forster new model. And this is a very well known model where the, we said that the the the, the hot and force model says that the power is related to the torque and the speed and the mill speed. And at the end, you can see it in the bottom the equation. And the equation is, is, is doing a relationship between the length of the mill, the diameter of the mill, the critical speed of the mill, the apparent density of the charge and the ball filling, and also the sin, uh, sin alpha. The sin alpha, as you notice, is the, the position that the charge takes in motion. So if you look at this uh, equation, or the, uh, the power equation, you can see that you have only two ways to increase the power. One of them is the increasing the, the middle speed or increasing the ball charge, the, ball, the, the total charge, the J. And also it's related to the apparent density of the charge. So you have only two ways, mainly two ways to increase the power, mill speed and the mill field. So as the mill power draw is also uh, directly proportional to the apparent charge density, we can then identify the contribution of the total power demand for each independent load component. What that means, 
that the total power of the of the uh, the uh, demand is going to be related to the three components. These three components, one of them is the the power growth produced by the balls. This power is related to the JB, the JB is the ball filling, and the row sub B, who is the ball density. You know that the ball density is 7.7, 7.8. And also is related to the apparent density of the total charge. The another company for the power is the power produced by the rocks. And this is related to the to the rock sub M, which is the density of the rocks, and the rocks the density is usually between 2.7, 2.8, and the difference between the, the total charge and the ball filling. So this fraction is going to be the power produced by the rocks. And the third one is going to be the power produced by the slurry. And this is the fraction of the slurry into the charge that uh, is related to the also to the Rosso P, that is the density of the slurry. And the JP is the fraction of the slurry in the total charge. So you can see in these three components, the more important component for producing power is the balls. The second one is the rocks, and the third one is the slurry. So if, if we move the charge of the ball charge in a higher level or a lower level, you are going to increase or to reduce the, the, the power. But also, if we increase the level of the rocks or reduce the level of the rocks, we are going to affect the total power demand of the segment. And that is what happens in the, in the operation. In this graph, for example, you can notice that we, we are uh, at, the, at the same, J should be a 12%. You are going to notice that the, in the red uh, line, you are going to see the total power or the SACMIL, and that is this power what you is the power you, that you are measuring in your control room, for example. But for example, what's happening if we begin with a 20% a total filling of the mill, 20%, yeah, and you are going to have a 9,000 kilowatts. If you begin to increase the rocks, the ball, the ball, the quantity of the rocks, the throughput, you are trying to push throughput into the mill you are going to begin to increase the, ball, the mill filling, for example, until 28. And the, the power produced by the ball, by the rocks, is, is going to begin to increase from 2000, almost 2000, until uh, 2008, for example. And the power produced by the rocks is going to, be, to begin to decrease from almost 3000 until 5,008. But in the balance, you are increasing the total power of, of, the, of the mill. But what happens? You are replacing that the balls by the rocks, the, the, the power produced by the balls, replace it by the power produced by the rocks. So at the end, what is going to happen? That the mill is going to be filling and filling increasing the, the total charge, increasing the total charge, but you are going to be limited, limiting the throughput. Because in some moment, the, the mill is going to be overload because you are not grinding. So that is why, what, what we call the, the false power. But you are obtaining power, but you are not grinding. So the apparent charge density, is that the relationship between the weight of the ball, the rocks, and the slurry divided by the uh, apparent charge volume of the mill. So, what is important? The important is that, that we have to define how is the optimal radio between the balls and the rocks. In what that means, we have to get the right balance between the balls and the rocks and we are going to get the lower specific energy consumption. In this graph, for example, 
the aparin, the optimal aparin charge density is, is around 3.45, more or less, and you are going to get a 5.4 kilowatts per ton. If you if you add more rocks, you are going to have a, a, a higher uh, more ball, more balls. You are going to have a low rocks. You are going to have a higher apparent density. But your specific energy consumption is going to begin to be higher. If you have a higher specific energy consumption, your throughput is going to be lower. And also in another way, if you begin to increase the the rocks. You have you are going to have a low balls. You are going to be to begin to reduce the apparent density. And you are going to begin to increase to your specific energy consumption. So in, in, in operation, usually you have this kind of graph where you are relating the, the, the power and the mill filling. And the mill filling usually is measured by the Berlin pressure or, or in some submit they have the weight of the mill. And they made a uh, relationship. Is that they try to fill the mill as maximum as possible until they get a uh, stable condition. And this stable condition is uh, almost um, when you are going to get an uh, overfilling of the mill. You can see this in a, like, this like in a, a slope. Yeah, this slope is going to be uh, uh, has a maximum. This is the uh, you have to work. A, a, in this area where you are avoiding the overfilling, but you are trying to get the maximum power at a maximum mill filling. So this, this is an example for, exa for, <coughs> for an operation. This is a, a comparison of uh, one month, this, uh, the, the February uh, uh, 19 against the February 20. You can notice that the pressure in the, in the X and the power in the Y. And you can see that the, the operation is trying to, to maintain as maximum as possible. It's, it's, a, it's just a high variable uh, pressure in the, in the middle. And uh, also the, in the other month, the, the February 20, you can see also. And there, there is some events that you can notice some events that the, the pressure is higher than the desire, and the throughput is not going to is not increasing as the power is at the at the maximum. When you make a relationship between this pressure and the throughput, you can see, for example, in this graph. In, in this graph, you have in the index you have the the pressure of the the, of the mill, the weight of the mill. And the way you have the throughput and the and the power, and you see in the throughput there is a maximum around uh, six thousand one hundred uh, the pressure. But if you are running the mill in a higher pressure, that means that the mill is has more weight. You are not going to get the maximum throughput. You are going to begin the reduce the throughput, to reduce the, the throughput. And also you can see that the power you have on a maximum, but if you are running the, 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 the power, uh, um, you are uh, obtaining more power than, than, you, than the optimum, it's no benefit for obtaining more throughput. So what that means, that we have to define what is the right mill filling and the right power to obtain the maximum throughput. Not running at a half power, a, a higher power, you are going to get the higher throughput. This is an, an example. For a, 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 it's important also to notice that each operation is going to, to run in a different way. So for each case, you have to perform the analysis to try to define how we the, the, the optimal power and optimal weight of the mill for obtaining the higher throughput. Another important important uh, variable is the mill speed. As I, as I mentioned at the beginning, 
most of the concentrators wants to run the mill at a higher speed as possible because higher speed is the higher power. And this mill speed is mm, usually related with the, with the critical mill velocity that we are running the mill. This equation is very low. But we are going to see how it effect. We are going to see how it effect. Uh, you have you you can look here um, three mill speed as a 8.6 rpm, 9.3 rpm, and 9.6 rpm. You can look that at 8.6 rpm the the charge is hitting um, close to the toe. If you increase the 9.3 rpm, you begin to hit a little bit the the liners. But if you are going to run the mill to 9.6 RPM, you are going to begin to hit the liners. So, but we don't notice that in the, our control room. Maybe you are going to have a noisy mill, and you, are, you can see, uh, you, have, you look at the, if you, if you have a noisy mill, you can say that you, have a, you are hitting the liners. But which is the, the, the right way? Because if we increase the speed from 8.6 to 9.3, we are going to get more power, much more power. And the theory says that if I get much more power, we are going to have much more throughput. But really, that is not completely true. Because if you notice here, for example, you have 9.3, 9.6 RPM, you are going to have much more uh, charge in flight. And this charge in flight is not going to grind. And also, this uh, this charge is going to hit to the liners, and this energy is going to be waste. So the idea is to try the uh, the right energy, the right power, but this power has to be used for grinding, not for hitting liners, not for maintaining the the charge in flight. So in in this case, uh, you can analyze which is the right mill speed, right this mill speed, and also you have to correlate according to the line, liner's time life, because it's not the same using a new liner that uh, uh, two months after you install a liner, or so four months you install a, your liners, because the liners are, big, uh, are warm, and you are going to, cha to, to change all the motion into the mill. What happened with the mill speed? In, in this graph, for example, uh, you have an, uh, at the bottom the, the black line, it's the 9.5 RPM. You can see how is the lifter impact intensity. This is a, with a lower speed, you can see if you increase the relationship between the JB, JC, that means the, the ball filling and the total charge, you can see that increase, you're beginning to increase a little bit the lifter impact and in intensity. But if you are beginning to increase the RPM, uh, the mill speed, you begin that, uh, you can notice that, the, for example, in the red uh, line, uh, that you can see that you begin to increase much more higher the speed, the lifter impact intensity. But if you increase, uh, increase to 12.5 RPM, you are going to need uh, to see that the, the impact, lifter impact intensity is much more higher. And you increase the relationship between the JB, JC. So that means that you have much more ball filling. You are going to have a higher impact intensity in the lifter. What does that mean? You can broke the lifters and also you can broke the, break the, break the balls. So, and this condition is not, it's not, it's not good for something. So that is the effect of the mill speed. Now we are going to see how is the, the effect of the liner design. The liner design has a, a great, a great effect in the in the charge motion. Well, what we have to know for doing a proper analysis of the liner design effect, we have to know the lifted angle. Usually, uh, 
uh, when we go to the to the sides, to ask the lifted angle, usually usually the main the metallurgical people doesn't know how is the lifted angle because the lifters I uh, are handled by the maintenance people. But it's important that the metallurgical people uh, knows in the right way how is the lifted angle, and also they have to know the relationship between the SNH, the spacing of the light lifters and the height of the lifters. So these are the, the three main uh, measurements that you have to know. The spacing between lifters and the lifter shape and the lifter angle. Uh, uh, so also we have to know how is the lifter lifting capacity because if you have an, a, a higher uh, a higher lifter, you are going to have a, a higher lifting capacity. Uh, we have to know the play thickness and the number of lifters. With this, all these three variables, we can perform the DN analysis and to analyze how it's going on with, the, with your liner design. What is the, for us, uh, not for maintenance, the, the maintenance wants only that the, the lighter, the lifters uh, timelines is as much as possible. But since the meteorological point of view, the, the main objective for the liner design has to be increase the grinding performance. What we have to do is increase the useful for interactions, the ball or, 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 and or liners, and to avoid the unwanted interactions, the ball liners. At the end, we are going to increase the availability. This is that we are going to have a uh, longer lifetime to avoid shutdowns, and reduce the lifter maintenance. And also, we are going to increase the grinding performance. For example, you can see here uh, uh, the, the effect of the lift angle. What happens if we change the lift angle in, in the, in the segment? In the, right, in the left, you can see the angle of 22 in, in the middle, uh, 26, and the, the right, uh, an angle of 30 degrees. And you can, you can see how the charge motion changes according to the, to the angle. For example, the angle of 22 is right in this moment because it's hitting the charge and not, it's not hitting that, uh, the liners. If we uh, begin to reduce uh, to, to increase the angle and, to, and, and to, per, to do less aggressive the angle, you are going to begin uh, to lose the impact in the toe. So, uh, you see, you can see this is not good for the mill because you have to, to impact in the toe. But what happens if we have much more energy to get from the, from the, for the mill? For example, you have installed 5,000 kilowatts, and you are only getting 4,000 uh, kilowatts. But you are limited by the angle. If you increase the speed, you are going to, you increase the speed to get more power, you are going to begin to hit the liners. So, uh, so what happens if we uh, change the angle? Uh, we change the angle. For example, you can see here in this uh, in this picture uh, at 22 degrees. For example, the 8.5 RPM is the red ones, and the 30 degrees 9.2 RPM. So increasing the RPM because we, uh, the, you can see here you increase the RPM to try to obtain more power. You can see that you have a better rendability in in two. Or fractions. The triangle triangles as the 25 millimeter one inches. You can see here with a, a higher angle, a high, about and a higher speed, you are going to have a, a better rendability of the one inches uh, particle size. And also in the in this fraction, this fraction is the the range between the one inches to two inches. You have a better rendability in this. In another one, there is not so so much effect, but you can see that you can increase the, the, the grindability. You can improve the grind of these times 
if the, if the, this particle size, two inches and one inches. So this graph is, uh, this graph is interesting now because what happens, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, previously, you had a, a, a power uh, available. But if you are going, if you begin with 22, if this, the, the, this black uh, column, you are uh, only obtaining 15 megawatts. If you begin to increase the angle from 10 to 22 to 26 to 30, at the same RPM, 8.5, you're going to begin to lose power. 15.1, 15.05, 14 14.99. And the power efficiency is going to be reduced from 75 to 74 to 74. But what happens if we change up to 30, the angle, and we increase the speed to 9 RPM, we are going to obtain 16 megawatts. I get one more megawatt, and also I increase the power efficiency, efficiency from 74 to 79. And also, if we increase to 30 degrees to 9.2 RPM, I'm going to obtain 16.39 megawatts, and I'm going to increase the power efficiency until 81%. So, we are getting more power, a much more power efficiency. But I have to redesign the angle of the, uh, of the, of the lifter. This only works because if you have power available. So you have power available, you have to look how we can get this uh, power available for, for productivity. Also, for what you can do also, also you can analyze how is the effect of the world liners. How is the right time to take out the liners out of the net? Because uh, as I told you previously, maintenance people likes to be to have the liners until doesn't have waves as much as possible, as higher throughput as possible. But is this good or not? So. For this, you can analyze how is the effect of the world liners. What happens with the liners? For example, you can see in this in these pictures uh, in in the in the left uh, side, you can see the march. It's just at 8.7 RPM at the beginning of the campaign. Then uh, they make a measurement in May, but at uh, that time they increase the RPM to nine. But you are noticing that they are losing, they are losing the impact into the toe. So they increase the nine RPM, but it's not enough. Maybe it could be to increase 9.1, 9.2. If the if the motor is is a, if the motor is a, if the power is available. Then in July, they continue running the mill at 9 RPM, and you also notice they are losing much more uh, impact in the toe. And at the end, in September, they run the mill at 8.7 RPM again. And they are no, uh, they are not, not having any impact. It's a pure abrasion sickness. So what happens? They are the, there, there is no wall, no liners in the at the end of the campaign. So at the at the end of the campaign, as the liners are worn, you your internal mill diameter is uh, higher. This is a higher volume, so it's, there is a more charge, more ball filling, and the weight of the of the mill is higher, and so there is going to be a, a limit by the weight of the mill. So that is the reason why they don't they, they are not running a higher throughput because they have a problem with the weight and with the torque of the of the mill. What happens with the throughput? 
you can see here a throughput. There is an uh, uh, analysis of the throughput. In, in March, the throughput was about uh, 4,149 tons per hour. In May, it's 4,247. In July, 4,321. And in September, it's 309. So they have a peak of, throup of, of throughput until July, more or less is, is, is more or less um, is stable. This is a variation to the or I think so. But if they continue using the same liner, the throughput is going to be reduced. So for us, what is the right uh, time for taking out the liners is in July. Not wait until September to to lose throughput. Because if you make the uh, the the financial cal calculation, I think so. Working at this rate is not good for the, for the project. And also, this is related with the energy kinetics in the tow. You can see here, a core, uh, the energy kinetics in the tow is uh, is going down according to the line as one. Maybe in this July, you can see here the en energy kinetics in the tow is is very very low, but maybe it's compensated by the volume of the mill, and, and that uh, lets uh, maintain the same throughput. But I think so the throughput is going to be uh, fine, maybe. It, it, each, each operation has to be analyzed in, for each case. It's not an recipe. It's only, it's only a, this, in this case, this is an analysis. What's another variable that we have to analyze is the the, the ball size effect. What is the ball size? Uh, for example, you can see here a comparison between the five and the five inches. You can see the, the trajectory, the motion of the charge is the same. There is no difference between the five and the five inches in, in trajectory. But if you see the uh, impact uh, in the toe, only, only in the toe, in this, in this fraction, you are going to, to see that if, if we use a higher ball size, we are going to have much more energy in the toe. We are going to increase the, the impact in the toe. It's for the same power, for the same power demand, but the ball size has much more mass, and they are going to have to take much more energy, and this energy is going to be transferred to the charge for grinding. But if you are going to use a higher ball, you are going to have a, a coarser uh, particles in, 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 your, in your recharge. And, and also, if we analyze how is the effect of the particle, uh, um, the, the ball size in the, in the particle size distribution. You can see here that using a five and a half inches, you are going to have a, ben uh, have a benefit. Also in the, in the one inches, in the 25 millimeters, millimeters, and also in this fraction, that this is going to be between the one inches and the three inches. So you are going to grind in a better way the critical size. Usually the critical size is between one inches and three inches. Using a bigger ball, you are going to have a better possibility to break the critical size. What happens if we uh, are going to use a, a bigger ball? Five and a half, five and a three quarter, and six inches. You can notice in the in the in the in, in the in the simulations that at the beginning, using five and a half, you have an, a component in the impact hitting the liners. If we increase the the to five and a in three quarter, you are going to have a, a much more energy hitting the liners and you, you are going to use a six inches where you are going to have much more 
impact, uh, uh, much more impact into the liners. So maybe you are going to destroy your liners and maybe you are going to uh, to break the balls. So you have to take care, before using a higher ball, you have to perform an analysis if your trajectory is right for, for using a bigger ball. What happens? What happens in the toe? What happens with the energy? Uh, you can see in, in the in the graph, and you can see in the in, in the left this uh, the table. With uh, with five inches, the energy produced by one hit of the of the five inches ball is around five uh, one thousand uh, joules. If we move to one, uh, five and a half, five and a half the energy is going to be 1,143. One you see, that means 13% more energy in the impact. And if you move to six inches, you're going to have a, a 27 more energy in comparison with the five inches ball. So for the same, for the same power demand in the mill, the energy that you are going to use for grinding is going to be higher, you are going to be used a bigger ball, uh, a bigger ball size. So you can get a, a better throughput, you can get a, a better grindability for the critical size uh, particles, but you have to take care about hitting the liners, breaking liners, and breaking the balls. What, what is the total charge effect? I have talked about the ball feeling, the, 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 the middle speed, the liner design, but what about the total charge effect? What is the, the right total charge effect? <coughs> In these um, graphs, you can see, for example, uh, the how is the trajectory using two different JCs. The JC is 21% and the JC 27% in for five inches in five and a half inches. And you can notice here that the trajectory is going uh, to charge, to change. If you are going to have a higher JC, so total charge, the, the prob probability of hitting the liners is going to be less because you are uh, uh, protecting, uh, much more protecting the, uh, the, the liners. What happened with the total charge effect in the impact intensity? You can see here in the in the in this graph the, the red uh, line is when you are running the mill at a total charge of 21 percent, and you can you can see here that this is the in, impact intensity is about the 60 between 60 to 60 65. But if you increase the total charge to 27 this in, in, in impact intensity is going to be reduced. That means that you are doing some kind of protection to the liners. You are avoiding to hit in the liners and you are uh, running the mill in, in the right way. That is what happened. For example, if you are running the mill in 27, you have an, uh, a, shut, a shutdown of the crusher and the, and the mill, the throughput to the mill is going to be reduced at the half. So, Immediately, the total charge is going to be reduced. And you are going to begin to hit the liner to hit the balls. That is the same when you are uh, reducing the solid percentage, for example. If you are running the, the, the solid percentage around 20, 78, but uh, uh, for some instance, you reduce the solid percentage to 61 or 71, so you are going to take out all the fines particles outside of the mill and the, your charge are going to be reduced. The mill is going to be empty. And you are going to begin to hit the liners and to hit the balls and you are going to begin to have problems. This is the effect, for example, of uh, the same JV and the 17% of JV. You can see how is the effect of the running at, at 20, uh, 25, 30, and 35. You can see here in the in the toe, 
you can take, take a look at the, at the, at the dough. Uh, with 25, you are in the limit. You are hitting a little bit the, the liners. With 30, you are avoiding to, to hit the liners. With 35, you are hitting only to the charge. So that is so important to control how is the right total charge of the mill. To try to avoid the liners and to try to hit only the charge at this, and that way you are going to use all this energy. Uh, it's going to be transferred to the charge and not going to be transferred to the to the liners, so you are not going to break the liners. If you increase it's the same exercise, but not at 17. This is uh, for 20% of JV. It's the same. If you are going to run in the, in the same way, but if you increase the JV, you are going to notice that you are going to begin with 25, you are going to begin to hit the liners. With 30, you are going to be in the limit. With 35, you are going to be also close to the close to the toe. It's, it's mainly in the toe, according to this graph. So this is the milling effect. You can see, as a summary for the milling effect, you can see these graphs. Also is the impact intensity in the toe. You are going to notice with the, when you reduce the, you increase the, the JC from 25 to 35, you are going to reduce the impact intensity in, in the toe. So and the, the, that's, that's just important thing. What about the particle size? The particle size has a strong effect in the, in the triplet. For example, what is important? First of all, you have to measure. First, you have to measure how is the, the range of the particle size fit to the stack mill. You have to, uh, to take a range. For example, this range is the fine particles in the bottom. It's minus two inches. The critical size is between two inches and four inches, and the, and the intermedium or the, or the coarse particles are going to be between four inches and six inches. And this is a trend of from, uh, one year, for instance, uh, May 19 until July 20. This is, a, this is a trend. And you can notice here, for example, that uh, the fine particles uh, has begun to increase more fines, the critical size is like a stable, and the coarse particles has been reduced. Especially in the, in the last month, uh, take care, for example, here in, in the last month in July 20, the fines is higher, uh, more, more, more fines, the critical size has been reduced, and the coarse particles also has been reduced. So at the end, what is important is because we make a correlation. You can see here how is the relationship with the throughput. The throughput, the throughput is in the x, and you can see here, for example, the fines uh, is in the up. This is minus two inches has increased in the time, and this is a, a direct relationship. As much finer as possible, you are going to have an, a positive. A correlation with the throughput. Higher fines, higher throughput. But also, at the same time, the critical size has been reduced from around 25 until 15 percent of critical size, passing pre critical size. You have reduced the critical size. You have re reduced also the intermediate particles of four inches to six inches, and the coarse particles has maintained. So, if you reduce the critical size, you increase the fine particles, you are going to get much more throughput. So that is the reason it's so important that we can measure and uh, this particle size distribution to the to the mill and try to make the right correlations. The first one is we have to define which is the, our critical size. The critical size could be one inches, two inches, one and a half, two and a half inches. There is one particle size which drives the, the throughput in the stack mill. So 
this is very very important you have to uh, install a uh, cameras in the in your belts and your in your feeders to suck milk you can you can uh, perform correlations to see how is going on with the throughput this is also the correlation with another suck milk it is same trend finer higher finer uh, uh, in, in the stack pit, lower critical size, lower intermediate size, and also the it's a flat uh, coarser particles, you are going to get much more trouble. <coughs> and this is the same, that, uh, as a summary of the last two ones, you can see with the time, uh, how they have improved the throughput from May 19 until uh, uh, July 20, there is a trend of increasing the throughput according to reducing the critical size and increasing the fine particles fit to the middle. Okay. So, that's all. I, I think so. Uh, uh, I want to to present some brief um, concepts from um, brief recommendation about the SAC mill oper operation. And if you have any question, uh, I can answer, or maybe my, my partners in, in the, from, from North America can answer about that. Thank you very much. Hola, Levi. Aquí tengo algunas preguntas que... Este. The first question is from... Um, let me see the name. I, I don't know. Patty, I, I can see the name. Is how to find the right power for higher throughput in practice? Uh, how to get the right power? How to find the right power for higher throughput in practice? Yeah, uh, I, she was mentioned that because she was seeing the, the graphs that you have from the power uh, and throughput. Yeah, uh, I, I think so. That uh, you have to analyze all your data. You have to first of all, you have to 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 analyze how is the the ball filling, how is the total charge, how is the the burning pressure and the and the weight of the mill, and make your own correlations. And, and your own correlations are going to show you how is the, the right mill filling. And the right mill filling is going to be related with the total weight of the mill. So for example, you are going to have an, uh, a very pressure of 6,000 uh, kPi. This is the, the, the maximum pressure. Uh, and this pressure is, is obtained by, for example, at 17% uh, of ball filling and 30% of total charge. And this is going to be the maximum pressure, and that maximum pressure is going to give you a maximum throughput. So you have to make the, this kind of correlation. This is, uh, you have to make, uh, I think, so uh, for, a, a, for each case, you have to make your own correlation to see how is the maximum power you can you can draw them, uh, you can get in the, into the mill. Okay, thank you, Levi. Here's another question from Dave, Dave Felsher. Uh, is on the context uh, of the of the of the sheet where you mentioned that increasing the speed of the of the mill can increase the power. You mentioned, and maybe we, you can go deeper on this. Is not increasing power leading to increase production a risky assumption? I can run a, a mill empty and consume power without milling anything. Can you go deeper on this on this question? Uh, yeah, you, you, I think so. You are right. You can, you can, you can run the mill at maximum, a maximum speed and a lower throughput. And you are not going to grind nothing. You are going to hit the line. And you are going to break the balls, everything. But uh, we are in the supposition that we are going to try to to obtain the maximum throughput. You are going to run the mill uh, at the maximum throughput as possible. Uh, with the uh, with an uh, PAT objective for the for the SAC mill, for example. So in that, if you are trying to get the maximum throughput, 
you can run the mill. Uh, usually, you can you are going to try to run the mill at maximum at maximum power because uh, according to the third theory, for for getting throughput, you have to get power to reduce the particle size. And to and if you are not going to to give energy to the mill, you are not going to grind, and the mill is not going to to get the throughput. I don't know you. I answer that. Let, let's ask uh, that. If is that, that that's the answer, maybe he can type it right now. Uh, uh, the other question that always is <laughs> made for us: which is better, rubber or, or steel? <laughs> it depends. This is the, my favorite answer. Is the, it depends. Um, uh, I. I, I in, in all time, uh, I see that the that most of the people uh, prefer the the steel because they say that the steel grind and the rubber doesn't grind. But they also the rubber takes much much more volume into the mill. If, if you if you are using uh, rubber liners, if you are going to reduce the volume of the mill. You are going to have a, a, a lower throughput. It is by the volume of the mill. But in, the, in, the, in these times, I saw many operations that are using a polymer. This is a polymer. It's a combination between the rubber and and, and steel. And uh, I, I see a good result. Uh, so I'm not expert in the material of the of the of the liners, but I think so that both of them could work. Depends. Uh, it depends of the of the design of the of the liner if they are transferring the the energy to the to the to the charge for grinding really i don't know an expert in the, in, the, in the liners but uh, i think so okay here we have i think this could be the last uh here we have a, one question considering a sag mill with a 30 to 32 f80 around a ball ball level of 18 to 19 Beneficial to have smaller balls than usual uh, than the usual. Maybe he can mention five inches. What's your thinking about this? Uh, if I understand very well the the question, uh, what is my thinking about using a smaller balls for a, a very fine uh, fit? I think so. The context uh, is that he wants to know if uh, selecting smaller balls. That increases the attrition instead the the impact. Uh, I think in this case is looking for size. Okay. Yeah. When, when What's you your are, opinion about that? Yeah, when you are using a smaller balls, you are going to have an, uh, a higher su superficial uh, grindability area. So you are going to grind finer. Uh, but it depends also on the motion of the of the of the mills because if you have a very aggressive uh, liners and you are you are your motion is cataracting you are not going to promote the cascading so you have to make a combination between the cascading effect and with the grinding media size so in another another thing is uh, you can use a smaller boss but your your uh, f80 so your fit size is very fine it's less than one inches or, or, or higher, no higher than two inches. Uh, I have an experience in, in Peru that is a sack mill that is using a four inches ball, but um, the fit size is uh, around 14 millimeters. So they want to, to grind very fine. This is a single stage mill, uh, but if you want an, uh, productivity, Smaller balls are, are not going to to help to you. So it depends what is the grinding tax and you have for your for your operation. But uh, using a smaller ball balls would be suitable depending on the fit fit uh, size of the ore and depending on the motion of the of the liners. I think so. Here's the the consideration is 30 to 32 millimeters. Yes, it's, I think it's Jana Koch. Yeah, it's the same. I was talking. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I think so. This is, uh, this is uh, the meal I was thinking. That is the reason why they are not using a bigger ball. They are using only a four inches ball. If they are going to change to to three inches or three and a half inches, 
uh, as has been talked before. I think so they can have uh, a finer granite, but they are not going to get the throughput they need because the, the, the problem they, uh, sometimes the problem they have is the throughput. Yeah. Guys, do you have another question there? No more questions. So I think what we'll do now is um, we'll basically show you the uh, results of the poll to see what our next upcoming course is going to be. But in the interim, if you want to stay connected with upcoming webinars um, and also face-to-face -face training that we have, please follow us on LinkedIn and also keep up to date with our website where we have all the information on our upcoming webinars. So based on the poll data that you provided, let's see what the next topic will be. So the voice of the group is that we want to have a, the next conference is going to be on